how's it going everybody this is matt from auditor sense and on this episode of audit trails we're going to continue our discussion on system boundaries and this is the second of our three-part series on system boundaries in which we're going to discuss the authorization boundary so back in 2002 the federal government started to realize it was becoming increasingly reliant on computer systems to process store and transmit sensitive government information and because of this, they drafted the Federal Information Security Management Act. And this standardized the framework used to protect federal assets from threats. It included things like requiring a plan for security and incorporating periodic review into the process to ensure that controls were still adequate over the course of time. And there's a number of different things we, we could discuss about FISMA, but today we're really going to focus on the certification and accreditation requirement known as the Authority to Operate, or ATO. So in order for a federal information system to move into a production environment, they first have to obtain what's known as an authority to operate, or an ATO. And in order to do this, they have to compile a set of documents, sometimes referred to as an ATO package, that contains system information. Things like a categorization of the system's risk level, um, a baseline of controls based on that risk level, system security plans, and other documentation such as a risk assessment. And once these are all compiled and brought together, they're presented to an authorizing official who determines if the level of risk associated with the information system is acceptable based on the implemented controls. But in order to define this information, we first have to understand what is encompassed by our information system. In other words, what is our system's boundary? So in order to help agencies meet the FISMA requirements, NIST, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology, was enlisted to draft security standards and guidance. And from some of this guidance, we can get a better idea of what is incorporated into an authorization boundary. So we see here, definition, all components of an information system to be authorized for operation by an authorizing official and excludes separately authorized systems to which the information system is connected. And then continuing that, we have from NIST Special Publication 837, with regard to the risk management process and information security, the term information system boundary is synonymous with authorization boundary. So based on NIST's guidance, by defining an authorization boundary, we're also defining our information system boundary. And by defining these boundaries, we can more accurately present that ATO package to the authorizing official so that they're able to grant us that authority to operate. So this aligns with that concept of assumed responsibility. Again, the person who is the authorizing official wants to totally understand what it is they're authorizing, what is in that authorization boundary so that they can make an accurate uh, judgment call based on the information. So in the last episode, we discussed internal versus external systems, which was pretty basic, but we see this plays directly into the concept of an authorization boundary. So we see with this new understanding that all systems internal to the information system are going to be included in the authorization boundary. And likewise, any system not included in the authorization boundary or the systems that the organization does not have direct control over are going to be external to the authorization boundary. And this is a subtle but critical distinction because there's a drastic effect on the level of effort we as auditors have to perform if an information system is internal or external to the authorization boundary. See, systems internal to the authorization boundary have to fully comply with all of NIST 853, whereas systems external to the, to the authorization boundary only have one specific control they have to comply with, SA9, external information system services. So in application, when we're defining the scope of an authorization boundary, we should include these three things into our consideration. So all system components that facilitate the same business and mission objective that reside in the same general operating environment and are under the direct control of the system's authorizing official. If it meets those three criteria, then it could be included within the authorization boundary. Now, again, this may not be a totally black and white distinction, and there's going to have to be a conversation with stakeholders, but these three components, if met, should be a, a pretty strong case for inclusion in the authorization boundary. So let's move over to our sample information system and take a look at how we incorporate things into our authorization boundary. 
so here we are back at our sample information system. Now, last episode, we took the time to classify these components as either internal to the information system or external to the information system based on who exercises control. And now that we've had a little time to talk through the authorization boundary and going off of NIST's guidance that states that information system boundary and authorization boundary are synonymous terms, we can pretty easily classify what's going to be internal to our authorization boundary. And that's these internal systems, which makes sense. Again, remember that there's an authorizing official, a designated person, who's given the okay for this system to operate, saying that it's at an acceptable level of risk. And because of that, they want to have total understanding of the authorized environment. And that's why all these internal systems are going to have to fully comply with NIST 853. All the families, all the controls based on the system's security categorization. Alternatively, these external systems are only going to have to comply with one control, SA9, External Information System Services. So we see here that this isn't just a functional exercise, but defining criteria for how we review an information system. It provides clarity to the system owner of their responsibility and allows the federal government to properly accept the level of risk that their information systems operate at. And while it is specific to federal organizations, private institutions may find value in defining their systems in similar ways. But one question may still remain here, and that's how we properly ensure the security of these third-party services that could interact with sensitive system information. And what if these third-party services don't interact with sensitive information? And how do we define sensitive information to begin with? So in our last installment of this series, we're going to talk about the security boundary that may start to clear up some of these questions and ensure that we have thorough consideration of the protection of all system assets. I hope after watching this video, you have a better idea of the authorization boundary and the A2 process as a whole. And until next time, I hope you have a great day. Thanks.